Good morning. Welcome to Campbelltown Free Church for morning worship. We're delighted that you're able to join us. So let us worship God. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, the eternal and final word, the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. We rejoice that after you made purification for sin, you sat down at the Father's right hand, your work completed. It is the once for all nature of your sacrifice to which nothing can be or needs to be added that gives us confidence to draw near in worship. You have been judged in our place for our sins and as a result all fear we might have about punishment, all anxiety we might have at the thought of judgment day and all uncertainty we might have about eternity is driven away. Lord Jesus, as we gather to worship you to the Father's glory in the Spirit's power, we rest on your finished work. Our hope is built on nothing less than your blood and righteousness. Bless us with your spiritual power and grace so that we might bring honour to you in this time. And we ask this as we always do in your name and for your sake. Amen. We're going to praise God. We're going to use the words of the song Jesus strong and kind.
us pray. O Lord, you are our God. How wonderful are all the gifts you give to us. How good they are. In a world of confusion, we praise you for the clear counsel, guidance and instruction of your word. As in it, you make known to us the path of life. In a world of despair, we praise you that you draw near to us, making us aware that you are with us so that we are not crushed because we discover in your presence there is fullness of joy. In a world of hopelessness, especially when it comes to death and dying, we praise you that we have the death-defying hope that because you did not abandon Jesus to the grave or let him experience decay and corruption, we have uh, the prospect of eternal life with you on the basis of his resurrection. We thank you that you raised him from the dead, filling us with the glorious future prospect of eternal pleasures at your right hand. O Lord, you are our God, therefore our hearts are glad and our tongues rejoice. O Lord, even as we joyfully acknowledge that you are our God and gladly praise you for all the good gifts you've given to us, our hearts are also heavy because we are sinners, sinners by nature and sinners by practice. You have given us your authoritative word, but we have not submitted to it. Our rebellious hearts constantly and defiantly ask, who is the Almighty that we should serve him? You have given us your life-producing word, but we ignore and reject it. We want to do what we think is best. We want to fulfill the desires of the flesh and our self-pleasing minds. We do not want to be different, but instead we want to follow the standards of our morally bankrupt culture. You have given us our, your transforming word, which renews our minds, reshapes our thinking and redirects our behaviour. But our hearts despise your teaching, rebuke, correction and training. We refuse to listen to your voice as it comes to us through those you have called to instruct us. Even though you have been so good to us, how hostile we are often towards you. O oh Lord, our only hope is that you presented Jesus as a propitiatory sacrifice of atonement. And as a result of Jesus' blood, we are saved from your wrath. Through his death, you have reconciled your enemies to yourself. So we throw ourselves afresh in your mercy and ask that for Jesus' sake, you would forgive us through renewed trust in Jesus alone. May we, may we experience all the joys of sins forgiven. O oh Lord, you are our God. Meet with us in this time of worship. Fill our hearts with joy and hope and assurance and peace. Help us to make you the only one in whom we trust. Enable us to follow Jesus and Jesus alone. Grant that we might love you with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. For Jesus' sake, hear us, forgive our sins, and accept our worship. Amen. We're going to read from the Bible from the Old Testament section of God's Word. We're going to read Psalm 125. This is a psalm about trusting in God and the hope we can have in God, especially in difficult circumstances. Psalm 125. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forevermore. The scepter of the wicked will not remain over the land allotted to the righteous, for then the righteous might use their hands to do evil. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good, to those who are upright in heart. But those who turn to crooked ways, the Lord will banish with the evildoers. Peace be upon Israel. Amen. Now let's pray again. Father, we thank you that we have been born again by your Spirit's activity and given new hearts that now delight in your ways. And yet, while we long to be holy, there is much in us that still cherishes sin and clings to it. Help us to hate our sin and to run from it. As you draw us toward heaven, open our eyes to see how offensive sin is to you 
and how damaging it is to others and to us. When we are dazzled by temptation, teach us that you are the only one who really satisfies so that we might feast at the banquet of your truth and drink deeply from the river of what you deem to be delightful. Help us to find in Jesus and in Jesus alone the fountain of life. And even as we struggle with sin, we thank you that this in itself is a clear indication that we are born again. We bless you that one day all our struggles with sin will be over because you have promised that you who began a good work of salvation in our lives will bring it to completion on the day of Christ Jesus when we stand before your throne, faultless, blameless and pure. Until that day comes, give us grace to struggle against sin and not to give up and to put all our hope in you. We ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. We're going to sing again. This time it's the hymn which speaks about God's love for us and how God overcomes our sin. It's his mercy is more. from the Bible, God's Word, this time the New Testament section of the Bible. We're going to read from 1 John chapter 1, 
uh, right through to ver chapter 2, verse 2. But before we read this uh, passage and think about some of the issues raised in it, let's pray and ask for God's help. Father, as Lord of heaven and earth, it is your good pleasure to hide your truth from those who think they know it all and who are full of their own self-importance and instead to show it to those who are humble, teachable and trusting in you for guidance. As we turn to your word, may its truth shape our thinking, control our emotions, regulate our values, determine our attitudes and govern our wills so that in every way we might make your truth attractive. And we ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we've looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to, to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. And this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defence, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Amen. Are there any signs of life? That was the question that Siobhan was asked when she phoned for an ambulance after coming across someone who had collapsed in the street. Yes, she replied, I have already checked. You see, Siobhan was an off-duty paramedic and so looking for signs of life was something that her training had taught her to do. How can I be sure I'm a Christian? You answer that question by answering a question. It's the question Siobhan was asked. Are there any signs of life? You see, the Bible's clear. If God has given you eternal life, signs of that eternal life will be seen in your life. So today, as I finish off this short series of sermons on the topic of assurance of salvation, what I want us to do is to look at the main signs of spiritual life. And these indicate whether or not someone is trusting in Jesus alone for salvation. The book of the Bible that speaks most about the signs of eternal life is 1 John. The verb to know is one of the most common verbs in 1 John indicating that John wrote to help Christians have that humble yet confident certainty that they were saved. The main way John does this in 1 John is to highlight the signs of eternal life and then invite us to look at our own lives to see if they are present. Okay, John says to us, you're not sure if you have eternal life. Here are the main signs of eternal life. Check if you have them. If you have them, you can be sure that you're a Christian. So according to 1 John, what are the main signs of eternal life? Well, here's the first one. You will believe what the Bible teaches 
about Jesus. You will believe what the Bible teaches about Jesus. Listen to what John writes at the start of 1 John 5 verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Do you see what he's saying? A sign of eternal life is that you believe what the Bible says about Jesus. And the Bible makes staggering claims about Jesus. Here are the main ones. Jesus was a real human being who experienced a real life in a real place that we can pinpoint on a map and at a real time in history. However, Jesus was more than a real man, a mere man. He was at the same time fully God, maximum capacity God. He couldn't be more God than he was. And he wasn't less God than he was. The Bible tells us that Jesus lived a perfect life. In fact, he's the only person in the whole of human history to never sin in his words, actions, motives, thoughts and attitudes. Jesus himself died a real death by crucifixion, not for his own failures and rebellious self-centeredness, but for our failures and our rebellious self-centeredness. On the cross, Jesus bore the punishment for our sins in his own innocent person. But Jesus did not remain dead. He rose from the dead physically and bodily into heaven where he reigned supreme over all creation. And the Bible says that one day Jesus will return for a second and final time to wind up history, to judge the living and the dead, to punish those who have refused to trust in him and to reward with heaven for all eternity everyone who's placed their trust in him. And all that, all this, these different things that the Bible says is, are locked into that phrase, Jesus is the Christ. And John says that believing this shows that you have eternal life, that you are born of God. Now, why is it important that you believe all that the Bible says about Jesus? Well, because only Jesus can save you. The Bible insists that the, the only way you can actually experience the forgiveness of your sins is by trusting in Jesus. It's inflexible and uncompromising about this matter. It's only trusting in the Jesus of the Bible that will give you this forgiveness of sins, this salvation that God promises through Jesus' death. It's only by trusting in the Jesus of the Bible that you will be saved. If, if you make up a Jesus that fits in with your own ideas, you will not be saved because an imaginary Jesus leads to an, an, an imaginary salvation. If you want to have assurance of salvation, you must believe what the Bible says about Jesus because the Jesus of the Bible, the real Jesus, is the only Jesus who will save you. What are the signs of eternal life? Well, the first one is believing what the Bible says about Jesus. Any signs of life in your life? No, John is not saying that you have to have a PhD in theology and know everything that there is to know about Jesus. He's asking if your view of Jesus is shaped by the Bible. If, as you read the Bible, you're, you're growing in your understanding of who Jesus is and what he's achieved. And if, you view, if your view of Jesus clashes with what the Bible says about him, you willingly submit to the Bible's teaching. Any signs of life? And then according to 1 John, a, a second main sign of eternal life is this. You will do what is right more and more. You will do what is right more and more. Listen to what John writes at the end of 1 John 3 verse 7. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Do you see what he's saying? A sign of eternal life is that you do what is right more and more. Now, we, we need to pick apart this statement very carefully 
And in order to do so, I'm afraid I have to take you into the murky world of Greek grammar because the tenses John uses here uh, are very important. The verb to do is present tense. And Greek uses the present tense as we do in English to indicate something that's going on all the time. Something that's always happening, something that's continually present. So what John writes could reasonably be translated, he who keeps on doing what is right more and more is righteous, just as he is righteous. Now, why is that Greek tense important? Well, for two reasons. First of all, because it tells us what John is not saying what he's not saying. John is not saying that Christians never ever commit sins. If he'd wanted to do that he would have used a different tense. He would have written in what's called the aorist tense but he doesn't. He uses the present tense. So John is not saying that a sign of eternal life, an indicator that you are a Christian, is that you never, ever sin. He's not saying that. Forget about the tense of Greek verbs for a moment. Think back to our reading. 1 John 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. John knows that Christians will sin. That's why he writes about confessing our sins and getting God's cleansing and forgiveness. John doesn't want us to sin. 1 John 2 verse 1. I write this to you so that you will not sin. But John is a realist. He knows that Christians do sin. So he goes on to say, but if anyone does sin... We have one who speaks to the Father in our defence, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. We need to give John a break. He's not going to write about uh, what to do when Christians sin and then a few pages later state that Christians never ever sin. He's not going to do that. So John is not saying that a sign of eternal life is that Christians never sin. You've got to kick that idea into the long grass. If that's not what he's saying, what is John saying? Well, back to the present tense of the Greek verb. One of the things we do is to brush our teeth before we go to bed at night. We, we do it instinctively. It's a habit. We, we don't have to be told to brush our teeth. That wasn't always the case. Children have to be reminded to brush their teeth before going to bed at night. Uh, and so too do two teenage boys need to be reminded of that until they start to notice girls and it changes. But we don't need to be reminded of that. We just do it. We, we, we do it almost without thinking. It's part and parcel of our daily habits and routines. And John is saying something similar about the way Christians do what is right. Before we were Christians, we did not do what was right. We did not uh, know what was right because we refused to listen to God in the Bible. And even if we knew what was right, we did not want to do what was right. But when we trusted in Jesus, all that changed. We started to read the Bible and in it we discovered what God wanted us to do. And because we wanted to please God and stop living to please ourselves, that's what the phrase, just as he is righteous, is driving at, we started to do what was right. And, and we kept on doing what was right more and more. And as we kept on doing what was right more and more, the present tense of, 1 John 3 verse 7. It was not that we never sinned, but it was that doing what was right became the pattern of our lives. We would never not think of doing what was right. 
just as we would never not think of going to bed without brushing our teeth. Doing what is right becomes a habit for us. Before we were converted, doing what was wrong was our, was our default position. But now it is doing what is right. And the more we do what is right, as defined by the Bible, the more this sign of eternal life will be seen in our lives. Now, I want you to notice for a moment what, where the emphasis in 1 John 3 verse 7 lies. You'll see there, it's not on the things that Christians do not do, but on what Christians do. He who does what is right is righteous. You see, very often we define ourselves by the things we do not do. I do not do this. I do not do that. I do not do the other thing. But that's not how John defines a Christian. His emphasis is on what Christians do. When the Bible talks about the signs of eternal life, it's much more interested in what's on our do list than what is on our don't list. You might say, I don't lie. The Bible says, that's good. But do you consistently speak the truth? You might say, I don't criticise others. But the Bible says, that's good, but do you encourage them? You might say, I don't get angry. The Bible says, that's good. But do you forgive others and show them kindness and compassion? You might say, I, I don't hurt or harm anyone. The Bible says, that's good. But do you love them and help them? Do you see, do you see where the emphasis in 1 John 3 verse 7 lies? He who does what is right is righteous. What are the signs of eternal life? The second one is doing what is right more and more. Any signs of life in your life? No, John is not saying that you have to be perfect. Neither is he saying that a sign of eternal life is what you do not do. He's asking if the pattern of your life what you delight in doing because it pleases God is to do what is right more and more. Any signs of life? Then according to 1 John, the third main sign of life is this. You will consciously try to obey God's word. You will consciously try to obey God's word. As he spent some time with his disciples before the maelstrom of his arrest and betrayal and desertion and trials and death took place, Jesus said this to his disciples, If you love me, you will obey my commands. Now, I'm afraid I'm not handing out any prizes for you working out that John is thinking about Jesus' statement when he wrote, 1 John 2, verse 3. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. How do you know you are a Christian? If you say you are, no, says John. You know you are a Christian if you obey what Jesus tells you to do in the Bible. Now, again, be careful. John is not and cannot be saying that you are a Christ, you're only a Christian if you perfectly obey the Bible all the time. One day you will perfectly obey God, but you have to die first. It's only in heaven that you will obey God perfectly all the time. John knows that. So he, he is not and cannot be saying that a sign you're a Christian is, of, is perfect obedience. So what is he saying? Well, we're back to our old mate, the perfect tense. John is saying that Christians are those whose lifestyles are characterised by obedience. Once we didn't obey God, we didn't want to obey God, but now we want to. And this obedience is not something that we 
do every so often when we feel like it or when it's convenient. It's something we go after more and more. Deliberately, we find out in the Bible what God is telling us to do and then asking God for his help to obey him because left to our own devices, we can't and don't want to obey him. Asking, after getting God's help, we intentionally try to obey God's commands. What are the signs of eternal life? The third one is seeking to show your love for Jesus more and more by seeking to obey what he tells you to do. Again, John is not saying that you have to perfectly obey all the time. He's asking if the characteristic of your life, if what you take pleasure in doing because it honours God, is consciously trying to obey God's word. Any signs of life? And then according to 1 John, the, the, the final main sign of eternal life is this. You love other Christians. You love other Christians. Listen to what John says in 1 John 3 verse 14. We know we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Could John have been any clearer? A sign of eternal life is that we love other Christians. God's family is not a dysfunctional family in which brothers and sisters never talk to each other, do not want to meet with each other, criticise each other and never help each other. John says that if you behave in that dysfunctional way, you're not a member of God's family, you're not a Christian. Instead, you show that you are in God's family by behaving in exactly the opposite way to a dysfunctional family member. You love other Christians. You meet with other Christians. You help other Christians. You defend other Christians. You forgive other Christians. You encourage other Christians. And again, no prizes for working out that John is picking up on something Jesus said. John 13 verse 34. A new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. But had not the Old Testament commanded us to love our neighbour? Yes. So why does Jesus talk about a new commandment? What's, What's new about it? Well, it's new because of the reason why we love. The Old Testament said, that we were to love our neighbour in the same way as we love ourselves. We were to think of how we would like others to treat us, and then we were to treat others in exactly the same way. But Jesus lifts this command up to a new and higher level. He says, we are to love each other as he has loved us. Jesus' love for us is the standard for the love we are to show towards other Christians. His self-giving, his self-sacrifice, his care, his encouragement, his putting the interests of others before his own interests. That's the template for our love for each other. What are the signs of eternal life? The fourth one is loving other Christians. Again, John is not saying that you love them perfectly. Christians do struggle and fail to love others in the way Jesus loves us loves us we know that because some of us are not very easy to love but what john is asking is this that if with god's help we try to love other christians do we do so using the standard of jesus love for us any signs of life now let me conclude We need to avoid two traps when it comes to thinking about the signs of eternal life. Number one, do not fall into the devil's trap of presumption. Some people assume that they are Christians because of the family into which they were born or because of the church of which they were members or because they are decent people or because of some experience they have had. And they dislike being asked to look at their lives to see whether or not they are Christians. 
get very hostile to the whole idea. Don't be like them. The Bible warns us about falling into the devil's trap of thinking we are Christians when in fact we're not. It warns us that our hearts are very deceitful. They lead us to assume that we are saved even when we show no signs of eternal life. And that's, the way, that's why the Bible tells us to examine our lives. Not every day, but regularly. It's like conducting a spiritual MOT. Our cars are not MOT'd every day. But regularly. And regularly we check them. And that's what the Bible says we are to do. So we don't fall into this trap of presumption. Uh, a helpful way not to fall into the, the devil's trap of presumption is to ask yourself this question. If I was put on trial for claiming to be a Christian, would there be enough evidence to secure a guilty verdict? But when it comes to thinking about the signs of eternal life, there's a second trap you need to avoid. Do not fall into the devil's trap of unreasonable self-condemnation. Unreasonable self-condemnation. Uh, this is the trap that most Christians fall into. And you're especially vulnerable of falling into this trap if you have a certain personality. There is the perfectionist. For you, good is never good enough. It's got to be perfect every time. So when you look at your life as you should, all you see, because you're a perfectionist, is the imperfect stuff. You do not see the changes God has made in your life for the better and for his glory. And perfectionists find it hard to avoid the devil's trap of unreasonable self-condemnation. As do the glasses always half empty people. For you, every silver lining has a cloud. So when you look at your life, all you see is what is not there, what is lacking, rather than what is there, what is present. In a sense, Perfectionist and the glasses, always half empty people, are really the same. You think that you could not be a Christian because you're not perfect and there are lots of things lacking in your life. Look, God is not looking for perfection here on earth. You will never be perfect here on earth. God knows that. One day he will make you perfect. But again, he's got to take you to heaven and you've got to die before that happens. But here on earth, you will never be perfect and God knows that. We're back to Siobhan. When she phoned for the ambulance, she wasn't, wasn't asked, is the person who's collapsed got a strong pulse? She was asked, is there any pulse at all? And all God wants to know is if there are any signs of eternal life at all, no matter how weak and fragile they might be. I love what John Newton says about this. I'm not what I ought to be. I'm not what I would like to be. But I am not what I used to be. And my dear perfectionist, the glass is always half empty, friend. If you can say that, I'm not what I used to be. That's fine. That's a sign that you have the signs of eternal life in your life. Let's pray for a moment. Lord Jesus, as you have taught us to pray, Deliver us from the devil's twin traps of presumption and unreasonable condemnation. May your Holy Spirit always guide our thinking as we obey the Bible's instruction to examine our lives, to see 
if there are any signs of eternal life. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your grace in saving us. Many of us can say that we are not what we used to be. We thank you too that when we sin by failing to do what is right more and more, by failing to obey your commands and by failing to love other Christians as you have loved us, you are a great saviour who forgives us, who cleanses us and who pleads for us as our advocate in heaven. So we look to you, Lord Jesus. Help us to know that through resting upon your work and resting upon your word and looking at our lives, that we have eternal life so that all our hope might be in what you achieved by your death on the cross and all the promises of your word and all that you have done and will do in us by your spirit until the day you take us to be with you in heaven for all eternity. Help us, O Lord, accept our thanks and hear our prayer. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. We're going to finish by singing together a part of Psalm 62. We're going to sing verses 5 to 12. Find rest, my soul, in God alone. A psalm that encourages us to put all our hope in Jesus and to trust in him for our salvation. Psalm 62 verses 5 to 11. Find rest, my soul, in God alone. And we sing it to the tune Heron Gate. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you very much for listening, for watching. May God bless you. And again, if you would like to contact me about anything that has been said in this sermon or any spiritual problem you might have, you'll find my contact details 
on the church's website or you can get in touch with us through the Facebook page.